Excellent. So thank you all for joining today. My name is Mo. I'm the Director of Strategy and Business for TB at PATH. And it is my pleasure and um, honor to be one of the moderators for today's conversation. As with all of these conversations, I know we're all used to speaking on Zoom and being part of these meetings, but we'll go over a few logistics to start with. We very much want to hear from all of you during this conversation. This is meant to be a conversation. So please share your questions and comments with us by submitting them in the chat or the Q&A box at the, during the webinar. Those are down at the bottom of your screen. We'll have some time in the later half of the hour for any audience Q&A. And we do wish to have the audience Q&A. Please note, we are recording this call um, so that participants who are not able, or so that participants who are not able to join live will be able to get a recording, as will all of you. And I see that we have participants joining from all over the world. And this is just really a, a thrill for us. And we're happy to have partners from governments, community organizations, NGOs, the donors, as well as private sector. And really thank you all for joining us for this important conversation. And then as you think about it, um, in, to start the, some of the conversation going, I'd like you to think about the following. If you could see one improvement in TB care, what would it be? Please do type your answers in the chat box and send your answers to all panelists and attendees. Now, as those comments come through, um, some of us on the panel will be trying to answer things live and um, as we go through. As an overview for our session today, I'd like to briefly introduce our panelists and then I'll turn it over to my co-moderator, Kiri Arvind Banushali, who is based in Mumbai and is an activist and peer supporter with the ORP group Survivors Against TB. And she's a coordinator with the TB PPM Learning Network. Kiri will help us frame today's conversation and then dive into facilitated questions with each of our panelists. So let me start with, we're absolutely honored to be joined by an incredible group of TB activists, practitioners, and policymakers. Starting with Dr. Saskia Denboon, a technical officer at the WHO Global TB Program. Jackie Hu, head of external affairs and strategic initiatives at the Stop TB Partnership. Dr. Henry Mwanika, regional director for digital health at PATH responsible for the Africa region. And finally, Bruce Thomas, founding and managing director of the Arcadie Group. Huge thank yous to each of you for joining us, as well as thank yous to all of the participants. Now, now that we've gone through logistics, I'd like to just touch a little bit on past TB work. Um, we've been working for two decades with global partners and high burden countries to overcome the burden of TB. Our work is driven by the knowledge that TB continues to be the leading cause of death among people with infectious diseases each year. We know that 2020 will be an aberration to that, but if you think about um, the comparison between high burden TB countries, TB continues to be the leading killer from infectious diseases. It kills more people, more women per year than all causes of maternal mortality and is the leading killer of people living with HIV. And all along, resistance to TB drugs is increasing and millions of people go undiagnosed and unreported annually. We are proud to be hosting today's session in partnership with the Stop TB Partnership and with the TB PPM Learning Network ahead of World TB Day next week on Wednesday, March 24th. There are many conversations happening around the world uh, regarding TB care in an honor of World TB Day. We wanted to we want to make sure that today's conversation stays true both the PATH's mission of improving health equity and the global commitments to patient and people-centered care for TB, and that those conversations benefit and are reflective of the patient's perspective on TB diagnosis, treatment, and post-treatment care. And I'm delighted now to hand over the conversation to Kiri, who will lead us today. Thank you to all of you, and over to you, Kiri. Uh, thank you, Mo. Uh, in today's conversations, uh, we will be focusing on changing the TB care from disease-centered response to patient-centered response. Uh, what we need to do is to lift the burden uh, from patients and empower patients to come with us and fight against this age-old, 100-year-old disease. So here is my cartoon. Now, this cartoon depicts agony of a TB patient even before uh, his or her medication starts. So this is what happens even before the medication starts. So 
now i would like to ask question to saskia uh, saskia uh, diagnosis is the is the first is the first is the first step which uh, uh, which must go right but in my case it went wrong uh, but it was like some 10 years ago um, now many uh, diagnostic tools have uh, like emerged so now this should not happen but even now the same mistakes are repeated uh, i would like to know from you what can we do to fix this okay and uh, hey. yeah i would like to know how, what can we do to right. fix this thanks gary yeah it's a very good question because you're right there's still every year about 3 million people that are not uh, estimated to have TB that are not registered as diagnosed and treated. So it's a lot of people. And that was before COVID. And we know that last year, uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, even fewer people with TB uh, were diagnosed and treated. So there is a big gap. Um, one way to address it could be through uh, TB screening to more rapidly identify people with TB disease and to get them on treatment. Um, so uh, by systematic screening for tuberculosis, um, who can reach people who are at high risk of TB and who might otherwise be missed by the health system. Uh, and screening serves two purposes really. First is to detect people with, uh, who have tuberculosis, but also uh, to reach people who might be eligible for preventive treatment to make sure they don't get uh, TB. Uh, so next week for World TB Day, uh, WHO will be releasing some guidance on TB screening, and that should help countries to identify communities and populations at the highest risk for TB, and also to implement screening approaches with new tools and tests. And those include uh, rapid diagnostic tests, such as EXPERT, uh, NTB RIF, and TrueNet, also uh, computer-aided detection, or CAT, for interpreting chest X-rays, and for people living with HIV, uh, screening tools that are recommended also include CRP, uh, C-reactive protein. Um, so we also release next week uh, an operational handbook that um, contains suggestions on how to combine all these different screening tools and, um, and offers like uh, screening algorithms for different populations. Uh, Saski, I have one more question. These all, uh, these all testing, these all tools are like, uh... But for a high burden TB country, which is like mostly developing countries, they'll, they literally find it um, very difficult to buy this thing, point of care testing, you know. In this country, even today, even today, they, they, they go with smear, smear microscopic uh, x-rays and there is also called tuberculin test, which I also got the same thing. So they still go. So what can be done to subsidize prices of this expensive tool so that this this country who are in a desperate need can get it you know yeah that's also a very good question uh, i just want to uh, before i get to your point of how can we afford it i just want to say that some of these older tests um, like chest x-ray there are so many changes that have happened in the last year uh, so chest x-ray remains very important for screening and triage and now we have like mobile and portable X-ray units. We have digital radiography. We have the CAD software that I mentioned before. And that makes chest X-ray a lot of safer and easier to use and scale up, for example, for screening uh, than it was before. And, and also tuberculin tin, skin test that you mentioned, it is not recommended for diagnosis of TB disease, but it still has a role also for uh, detecting people who could you know, benefit from TB preventive treatment. Uh, but you're right, uh, these tests are, um, uh, are expensive. Uh, at the same time, I think screening um, has, is important to find, you know, it finds it's both important for on an individual patient level as well as on a community level. So for patients, by finding them earlier and starting treatment earlier, it can really improve their outcomes and reduce also costs for patients, for example including uh, catastrophic out-of-pocket expenditures and things like that. Um, and also for communities, if, if screening can find people earlier, it can also help to reduce uh, prevalence of TB and, and cut transmission uh, and thereby uh, hopefully save costs later on in the, in the later on. 
Um, so, um, uh, yeah, I think um, if we look at um, paying for these yeah, treatments and tools for diagnosis and care, uh, you could look at, for example, um, uh, joint procurement, uh, like market shaping and ensuring some guaranteed market for treatments and tools, which allows uh, like a stronger position in price negotiations. And for example, we have there the, the global drug facility that plays a role. Um, but of course, to implement, for example, screening, uh, and also to make sure that um, there's enough resources to accommodate the increased demand for diagnostics and for treatment. As a result of screening, uh, we may need additional resources. And, and there are also uh, funding agencies like the Global Fund or other donors that can fund screening activities. Um, but there's also a strong call for countries to, to push for greater domestic funding for TB because countries do need to invest in TB services um, and, and, and um, including in screening to reduce the pool of, of people with TB. Um, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Now my question is for, okay. Now my question is for Bruce. Okay. So uh, after you know that you have TB, there is a stage called denial stage. You don't accept it. Okay? No, no, I cannot have TB. Then the stage come acceptance. It, the same thing happened with me. After I accept, uh, after the denial came the acceptance stage. It happens with many people. Now, uh, once you convince a patient to take to go to go and take treatment, how can we make it sure that we uh, that the patient does not fall in between the gaps uh, gaps along the course of treatment because it often happens. And there is one more question for you. Um, with all this digitization and all these digital tools available, uh, the people who are seeking care from government cent centers in developing countries, how can they shorten the distance between treatment center and patient with the help of these tools? Uh, I can't hear you. You are on mute. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Carrie. Um, so let me take those two questions one at a time. So the first one is, how can we eliminate these gaps? Um, and I think, you know, the point here is that I think we need to move um, rapidly and, and um, toward a more test and treat model. So, so Saskia just talked about the myriad ways that we can diagnose the important thing is that all of those diagnostic tools with systems like India's Nikshe, for example, that diagnostic information is linked into the same system that is used to manage patients, including self-administering patients who are using digital adherence technologies. And so, so I think that these integrating systems um, really close that gap um, and reduce the time which, um, because if you have a delay in treatment initiation, you're going to have suboptimal linkage to care. So the faster we can do it, the more integrated diagnostics and treatments can be, uh, the fewer gaps I think will emerge. So I think these integrating systems are very much on the right track. It's the way that we wanna go. Uh, and one, then, yeah, yeah, please. No, no, continue, it's later. I got it. I, I, one more question, uh, it's like, you continue, please. Okay. So the second question that you asked about closing this gap uh, between the treatment center and the patient. So I actually believe that TB care, particularly daily medication taking, need not be and probably should not be uh, facility-based. Um, in recent years with FDCs and particularly uh, enabled by these digital adherence technologies, many more patients are being given custody of their medication so that they can self-administer uh, at home. And I think the important thing is that, that so for example, digital adherence technologies really um, are designed to, um, to allow patients to confidently self-administer. So, you know, patients will receive reminders, they'll receive assistance on with dosing instructions. And these tools create a channel between the patient and the provider that, um, that allowed the patient to reach out via IVR, SMS, WhatsApp, 
when and as they need support. And I think the other side of the equation is that these tools also uh, um, increase the time and effectiveness of staff because they allow the providers to continuously triage their patient population and focus their time and energy on those patients who are demonstrably having issues. So to me, that not only closes that distance, but it creates a more convenient, more patient-centered, more concordant approach. Uh, uh, it means th those tools also provide mental and social support to the patient. And what uh, uh, patients generally need human support. They need, they need to talk yeah. to people and get their doubts clear. So these tools will also provide all this kind of support, mental support, which- They certainly- support support which we need during the treatment when we sure. need to talk to some human like not machine so yeah. these tools provide all kind of supports well so they have enormous potential to address the challenges of mental health support and social support particularly for self-administering patients i will say that a lot of exciting development is underway um, not all of these tools are present today, but, but the tools can help in, in really three ways. So first of all, through this channel, we can deliver messaging and content that's encouraging to patients um, or that provides information to, to address some of the, you know, the mental health challenges. The second thing is through this channel, patients can actually, you know, it can be sort of a hotline, you know, if they really are having issues. But I think Lastly, the tools, as you rightly suggest, can find and create peers or treatment supporters and facilitate that, uh, that ongoing interaction for that social support. So while I think a lot of this is in development, I think the potential is really quite exciting to address those challenges. Thank you very much for your answers. Cheers. Now, uh, now my question is for Jacqueline. Okay. <laughs> Jacqueline, uh, our TB programs in most of our developing countries are focused on disease control. Uh, they completely forget that diseases don't exist in isolation. People are infected with the disease. So if you want to, if you want good outcomes from your program, you have to make sure that you take proper care of your patient and you make sure that uh, they do what you are asking them to do. So, uh, so I have a question for you that uh, uh, how can we build a system? How can we build a system which focuses around uh, user experience more? Uh, in every mm -hmm. sector, we know there is a user experience. Only in the health sector, they don't have it. So how can we build a uh, system where user experience is given top priority? And I've got one more question for you what should be done to build a patient-centric care model? Yeah, so maybe, uh, Carrie, first of all, um, I'm a bit embarrassed because I feel like I should be asking you this question and hearing your story um, about your journey. In, in, um, uh, in you know, I think um, like a lot of the various conversations that are taking place in the world today, um, when you are trying to tackle and solve for major challenges and issues um, like um, more people-centered care models, there are some basic, I think, acknowledgements and level setting um, that needs to happen first before we can even start seriously like talk about building a people-centered TV care model. Um, and, and, and by that, what I mean is, for example, to be honest, I think a lot of us um, give a lot of lip service to phrases such as putting people at the center of the TV response, being country driven. Um, but I have a question for all of us here um, in that how many of us consistently and regularly directly engage with TV affected people, ask them questions, hear their stories, put ourselves in their shoes and ask them to pressure test our assumptions and work. And I think, um, you know, the reason why I'm asking um, this question is in order to build a people-centered TV care model, it needs to be 100% anchored in deep empathy um, in what a TV person's like day-to-day -day life is like. 
um, the decisions, Kiri, that you had to make every day um, to, to access care and, and, and know what has worked for them and what has not worked for them. And, and so very quickly, I think, you know, um, one of the big initiatives at the Stop T Partnership is something called Reimagine TV Care, um, which we have partnered with a lot of partners, including um, the Arcadia Group, PATH, et cetera. Um, and as part of this initiative, like what we are really trying to do is drill down on, on this um, um, kind of questioning and answering. Um, so for example, we are working quite closely with the TB affected communities and people to get answers to questions such as, what are the critical moments for a TB affected person in their care journey? What are the needs and wants of a TB affected person during these critical moments in their care journey? Like what kind of solutions um, address these needs and wants. And, and, and I, I, I put that last because sometimes I think we get so caught up in the shiny new um, solution and tool that we forget that these solutions and tools are here to serve the TB affected person. Um, and so I think going to, um, I think I answered your questions in reverse. So I think I just answered your second question. Um, but in answer to your first question, Kiri, um, it is actually very aligned with what Bruce has just said. Um, you know, like um, right now I'm, I'm a bit of an anti big technology evangelist because I have some concerns about how um, uh, their strategic and operational principles and values are like. But having said that, you know, let's think about Amazon um, and, and how they have built their business around customer needs, wants, and experiences. And we need to do the same for TV care. We need yeah. to find ways, right, where we capture automatically um, as a TV affected person is getting treat, diagnosed, um, treated, um, cared for, um, their insights and what makes them happy and unhappy about the services they're receiving. Like, how do we make that automatic, Agreed. right? And then, and then we need to develop um, and improve the analytics and metrics to better understand that TB affected person's experiences as that feedback is getting captured because then we need to think about how do we tailor interventions um, that works for them. Um, yeah. And um, the third thing, which is the most important thing to be honest, um, Kiri, is we need to make sure that we empower the TB affected person to provide those insights. You know, they need to be like, I, I it's my right to tell you what I is working and not working and provide that feedback and not be fearful of providing that feedback, but like really believing that it's their right to provide that feedback. And, and I think, um, you know, one way to do this, and this is what we are starting to work quite closely with PATH on and other partners is what Bruce has mentioned that we are in the process of um, introducing, dem demonstrating, introducing, rolling out this open source interconnected care platform where different solutions across a care model um, are integrated and interoperable, meaning that not only is there a unified ICT system for patient management that talks to the different solutions, but gets the data in real time. Um, and it can also interpret this incoming information as it is received so that the care model is not this fragmented model, but an end-to-end -end solution. So maybe I'll stop there because I know I've been just like talking nonstop. <laughs> Thank you very much for your solution. And uh, here I have a question for Henry. Uh, okay, here is again question on technology. Adv I see that uh, advancement in all technology and everything is great. It should happen. But what's point if it is not available? It is not accessible. It is, it is so expensive that the people who are in desperate need cannot have it. It's no point then. You make great tools, but the people who need those tools, they can use it. So for you, I have got two questions. Uh, what should a developing country with a high burden of TB must have in place to adapt to this digital tool and make it a part of the TB program? And... Uh, uh, how can I, uh, how can they, it's like, I think this is a repetitive question, but uh, 
since all those things are so expensive how can they purchase it I means who will help them purchasing this tool and making helping them to make it part of their tb program it's is a repetitive but it comes again and again and again then countries are mostly like they are not having that many resources to put into every, everything you see so these are the two questions for you uh your mic is thank you those are excellent questions yeah so respond to your first questions uh, we've seen many many countries are adopting and um, uh, taking for granted all these advancements in technology and one of uh, one of common factor that differentiate those are who are successful and those who are not is uh, who those who are struggling is ability to have a plan in place that provides a, a roadmap of where a specific country wants to um, uh, as a vision for the country. And this can be done through development of their digital health strategy. And there's a lot of guidance that is available uh, through from WHO or how countries can go through the process of developing a strategy. So one of the things that needs to be in place is to make sure TB is included, uh, is part of your digital health strategy. That will help in all the investments that are coming in the future, TB will become part and parcel of it. But also we know TB is part of overall ecosystem of the health uh, system. So um, it has, we have to take a holistic view of not only vertical view so that we know how everything else uh, will connect with each other. Simply because a, a TB patient today will be a client of ANC or any other services tomorrow. So how do we take a holistic view of the client, not only specific to TB? Also, we need to make sure that uh, when the development of digital strategy, they, um, they involve all those stakeholders who are working in that particular country. So that um, to avoid double investments in certain areas. So, uh, so that when somebody is investing on uh, vertical like other diseases, how can we use those investments to benefit TB or any other uh, diseases? Um, so stakeholders should be involved from the inception and we need to have uh, mechanisms in place like governance structures to make sure that people come together and discuss. Also, when you talk about um, these tools, they have to uh, complement the process of TB uh, service delivery workers. So they don't come in as data collection tools, they come in as um, tools that will enhance the work that these uh, hardworking healthcare workers do. So it complements their business processes. So one of the areas going to your second question is about how can we reduce the cost? Um, we've seen um, a, a lot of talks about global goods. So global goods are those tools, digital tools or another tool that works in one environment and we can enhance and make made it and, and um, we make it generic so that other countries can benefit from. This is beneficial because all those investments have been that have been made in first country can benefit another country. So you lower the barrier entry so that uh, they don't have to reinvest in areas that um, others have invested in. So global goods is one of the areas that um, can reduce the cost and provide access to these tools that have worked in one environment and be can adapt it and made it available for other countries. That would be very beneficial. And also um, having enterprise architecture in place. I like what Jackie said that uh, we have end-to-end -end digital solution that can plug in. That is useful if you have an architecture for a country because you know how different systems can communicate with each other, what data can they can share, and how they can avoid duplication of effort. So those are some of the things that uh, we can do and make tools available uh, for other countries to benefit from in order to reduce the costs for those countries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I have a question for all of you. Um, we all know that COVID-19 has disrupted um, it's like has disrupted everything and we all have all TB programs have, has some um, it's like have set some targets which like it's now 
very difficult to achieve. So what can a global organization do to help TB patient and survivor advocate on behalf of themselves? I mean, uh, it's like, what can, what can I, um, what I want to say is I'm not able to, uh, okay, this question is for all of you. Now, uh, since we have decided that we will be including TB survivors and patient part of this fight. So what can a global organization can do to help TB patient and survivor advocate on behalf of themselves? So it's for all of you. Um, Kiri, maybe I'll, I'll start um, and hopefully you can see more of my head because I know my head was cut off um, when I was initially <laughs> speaking. Um, but I think organizations like the SOPTI partnership, I mean, there's a couple of low hanging fruits that we can do um, to, to support um, the TB affected um, communities and people. And, you know, the first and foremost is very easy, simply to amplify the voices and the stories of the TB affected communities and people. And so we've started to really do that. Um, recently, we, we supported the launch of a TB woman network. And, um, and it was, you know, we had a really great webinar um, about um, a week ago where just even understanding um, and providing a platform where we can hear as a TB affected woman the struggles that they went through and just making people hear their stories over and over again to really understand what um, people are going through on a day-to-day -day basis and the decision-making um, choices they need to face is one easy thing we can do. But I think the second thing like organizations like the SOPTI Partnership can do is continuously try to identify ways to empower and strengthen and support the TB affected communities and people and, 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 and make them the, the, the main drivers of the TB response. And um, you know, we do have mechanisms like um, the Challenge Facility for Civil Society, and we are continuously trying to strengthen that platform um, to, to really find new approaches um, that may be even very crazy. Um, to empower, strengthen, and support um, TB-affected communities and people. Okay, thank you very much. Now, it's like, uh, it's over to you, Mo. Thank you, Kiri. Thank you, panelists, for all these comments. If I could take a second, I'll just try and recap and then we'll go to some of the audience q and I've seen some questions come in on the Q&A box. Please keep them coming. We'd love to try and address as many as we can in this piece. I'd like to start just a quick wrap up is, you know, Saskia spoke to the screening and diagnosis and of patients and, and the improvements and recommendations there. And, and we'll be seeing more of those coming out next week, as, as Saskia has said, and um, we'll try, we'll ask Saskia if you could help us share a link to those information to all the people who are listening here today. Um, Bruce spoke to the importance of giving patients custody of their medication, which is such a, a simple piece of empowerment for patients, just to give them the trust that they have, that they will be uh, part of the solution to their own um, their own health issue. And also though, that the promise that as digital health technologies continue to improve, adapt and iterate, um, there will be more opportunities for integrating um, mental and emotional health supports into those systems. Jackie, I think eloquently talked about the, the need to engage with people affected by TB. You know, we can talk, um, uh, we can talk a lot about um, the you know, about a people centered approach, about a patient centered approach, but if we're not actually engaging with and listening to the people affected by TB, how can we be sure that we are being responsive to their needs? So we need to make sure that we are empathetic, but also checking that empathy by listening to, to survivors, listening to TB patients and um, continuously engaging them, which is their right as holders of the right to health. You know, they have a right to health, they have a right to, to speak, and um, we need to make sure that we as um, programmers of TV services are listening to and responding to that right and you know, granting them that right and not withholding it from them. And then Henry spoke to um, the, the, the tension between 
the need for health systems and health infrastructure to be holistic because um, they, you know, a health system has to cover every aspect of health, um, but also the, the vertical nature of funding, which is that you know, money comes for TB. So we have to make sure that in vertical investments are um, holistically, are, are driving holistic health. So that you make an investment in TB and that has to improve not just TB, but all aspects of the healthcare. And he, he made specific reference to then to how global goods can be used as an opportunity for that. So I really appreciate those comments. Um, there's a couple interesting Q and A that have come in, and and the um, the first one, um, and thank you, Bruce, for t tackling this already. But it comes from from Dr. Sood in India, who talks about um, wanting to engage TB patients. And so I'd like to actually give this question to Kiri first. Um, Kiri, as a former TB patient, as a TB survivor, how have you becoming, you know, how, how, how have you come to be here today, for instance? You know, what is, um, talk to us about, the, um, you know, Survivors Against TB and the role that that okay. group plays and how other TB patients and TB survivors can join. Survivor Against TB really plays a great role because, you know, what happens, um, that group really helps you to cut your past away and just express yourself what had happened and it makes you free you know uh, i was like i was not talking about this for 10 years after i joined this place they made me speak it out in some of places a couple of places i went and i told my story so it, how it helps i'm telling you how it helps to a tb survivor it helps to cut means cut out the cord which is like past cord now we have to just come out of that you had tb and there is nothing to be ashamed of tb it's like um, flu or any other um, illness you have so when you speak it out it's like gone from your system and it is really helpful and they also give us a responsibility where you are the one who are guiding other tb patient so you get like you feel empowered in a way so they empowered all this they they help in empowering TB patient to like be the guides of those who are struggling now. So it really feels good to do these things, you know? So this is how it happened. And I feel this kind of support groups are very, very, it, 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 this kind of support group, group more, of, more of such should exist, you know? So it will really help because there are so many TB, TB patients. It's like, you cannot even count. So it's like, so many of it's the support group, uh, exist and they provide this kind of help it is beneficial to survivors and also to the patients so hope i answered your question kiri yeah. thank you that was fantastic and so okay, um uh, dr dr sood we'll, we'll make sure that we have a, a link for you to um, survivors against tb so you can you can find out how to link your patients to that group um a question also came in from betsabe and, and, and saskia i hope you we can direct this question to you um, Betsabe, and, and I, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, but Sabe asked, in countries where TB is less prevalent, diagnosis and treatment may be delayed because healthcare workers do not consider TB in, in a differential diagnosis. Um, and are there recommendations that are coming in, in as part of this package next week that answer for those countries? Thank you. Yeah, so thanks for that question. That's a good question. Um, in our, uh, yeah, so I think um, what is important is that in um, countries, for example, with lower burden uh, in a general population, there might sometimes still be subpopulations that are at higher risk for tuberculosis. And in those populations, screening could be uh, playing a role. Um, and I think, um, so I think for those populations, it is important that indeed healthcare workers are aware that uh, tuberculosis might be uh, a, a differential diagnosis that they should consider in their evaluation. Um, I think also with increasingly um, diagnostic platforms such as uh, uh, Gene Expert that have also uh, provide tests for other diseases, for example, for COVID might also uh, help for, that it's easier to run uh, samples for different diseases, for example, and include tuberculosis there. Uh, but yeah, it starts definitely with awareness and even considering um, tuberculosis as a potential uh, potential uh, disease among that patient. 
Thank you, Saskia. Um, I have a question here um, first uh, for you, Bruce. It's and it's a question both for you, Bruce, and for you, Henry. And the question comes from from one of our attendees, and it asks um, if we make a, a cell phone application, a mobile phone application that is patient centric. Um, what makes that patient centric? How could it be? How is it beneficial for a patient? Is the question. Thank you. Well, maybe I'll go first. Um, so let's talk about, um, um, you know, there are some of these tools. Um, I've talked about digital adherence technologies. Um, um, it's an early, it's a good example of something that is, you know, that is made available to self-administering patients. And it is intended to be, and I think is increasingly becoming more patient-centric. So one, um, you know, I think it needs to be delivered um, in a pragmatic way, in a convenient way. So not every patient has a smartphone. So you have to think about delivery of these things to patients who may have access only to feature phones or, or to some other technologies. And so I think, you know, that sense of what is a, you know, a pragmatic solution is the first thing. But then I think the second thing is to really think about how this is going to be of help and assistance across the patient journey. So one of the bad things about TB is it's a very long treatment. And so throughout that journey, there are going to be challenges and issues that are, you know, some of which are predictable um, um, where the patient is going to need support. So things like, like um, you know, helping with confidence about when and how to dose. The TB regimens are very complex as well. So how can patients be confident that they know how many pills to take, when to take them, you know, with food, without food, whatever. Um, but then I think also throughout the journey then, you know, just communicating uh, or being available uh, to be, um, you know, for patients to communicate about the normal challenges that will come up, whether it's mental health or side effects or, you know, social support generally. Um, you know, I think this more sort of, you know, patient-centric approach where all of these things really should be, as Jackie said, they should be designed by, not just designed for, you know, TB-affected people. So I think We've actually made a pretty good start in this area, but I think the more we have patients involved in that process, uh, the better and more patient-centric these applications will be. Yeah, I'll just add um, one point. And I think Bruce mentioned a very critical point that uh, access um, should be, these apps should be available both on smartphones, but also how can we make it available for those uh, um, other type of phones so that more patients will have access to that information. But also another aspect of this is um, for the users. We, that mobile app needs to be easy to use because you won't be able to provide training to everybody. How can you make it intuitive so that your target audience will be able to utilize it without the need of um, having going through a long training? But also from the other side of service delivery, this mobile app, if it is on the other side, um, of, which, which is used by the service delivery, it has to enhance patient experience, to improve patient experience. And this means that uh, uh, service providers need to have access to information so that patients will have good experience, like availability. It has to prompt when they're running out of stock. It has to prompt when they have to take a certain um, test because um, based on the data that they have, uh, they need to take some action. How does that app provide um, uh, support decision-making of the service delivery? So there are two aspects of uh, patient-centered approach. So it's patient as a user, but patient as a patient when they go to visit health facilities. Thank you, Henry. Um, I noticed that uh, Teresa Osunde had her hand up, so I'm gonna actually Teresa, I'm going to unmute you and let you ask the question to the panel, if you don't mind. Go ahead. Um, all right, I have lost Teresa. I apologize. Oh, there you are, Teresa. You may unmute yourself. Uh, 
All right, Teresa, we'll come back to you in a moment or two. Um, in the meantime, um, Kiri, I'd like to ask you uh, another question, which is, um, and then I'll come back to your question in a second, Teresa. Kiri, as a survivor, you know, you, your experience with TB was a decade ago. And, but in the meantime, you know, you've had a career, you've taken on activities and are now an advocate. But, you know, how can we organizations, national TB programs, uh, service providers, interact with TB survivors without adding burden to your lives, without, um, you know, without being raising painful experiences and, and also being sure that we aren't, um, we aren't taking away time from the rest of your life. You know, you, you, you've had TB, you've now, you're, you as an individual, Kiri, have been a volunteer now, but there are, you know, millions of other TB survivors that we should be interacting with and engaging with. And how can we do so in a way that is, um, you know, adds value to the TB service delivery and TB programming, but is not a burden to you as individuals? Actually, if you ask me, um, helping people should not be burden on anybody. But if certain people who think that this is a burden on us, then they should not be part of this. Because you know what happens? Something wrong with went with me. Okay, I'll keep it with me, and I will let. I will not talk about it. So this will happen to ten other people. So it's better. It is a responsibility of a person to talk. I'm not saying that you uh, full you 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 be like an advocate for a full time, but if you if something went uh, during your treatment, it's your responsibility to point it out. It's uh, again like if you don't point it out, how will they know? They are not aware that they are doing something wrong. If I don't say that this this went wrong during my treatment, you will the people who are doing this big work they will realize that these these things goes wrong. Uh, during treatment, so we'll make it a point that these this these, these things should happen so that it should not go wrong. For example, earlier I have heard that some notifications were not happening, but now they are happening. TB notif. Uh, now, if you in up in private sector uh, in all this developing country in my country earlier there there were no notification. They used to go to the private sector and they were not not notified that we have got a TB patient. They used to treat like a regular patient. But now I think if anywhere you go you have to notify government this this we have we have got this TB patient. I've heard about that. So it's not a burden. So how can you you can how can as you as an organize, uh, organization do you can just advertise you can just say that we are the we are here um uh, helping you to reach out many like you like like you uh, uh and to enable them to fight against this disease so with your experience they will be able to fight better so it's like you can do that you can just spread the word and ask people to join your fight because I got TB, I got cured. This is not how, as a human being, we should live. We are like, we should live in a way where we are a kind of help to people around us, at least if not beyond our neighbor neighborhood. No, at least we should be helpful to our neighborhood, if not beyond that, I mean to say. So that's it. Thank you, Kiri. So I'm gonna, um, we're gonna answer one last audience question. I do see more questions in the chat box. And so what I'd like to say is we will, um, we will share these questions among the panelists and we'll make sure that we get responses and those will be shared with the participants. So um, do feel free to continue to send in questions. If, if we don't answer them live, we will work to get, make sure we share answers with everyone because I think it's, um, we, we do wanna keep the conversation going. So um, I did call out Teresa a moment ago. So um, I'd like to answer her question, which is um, most people in rural areas um, die without uh, from TB infection without treatment or medications because treatment services are not decentralized. They're 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 very much um, you know maintained at community bases. So actually, I'm going to push this question to you, Jackie, because I think um, I'd be curious to hear about how um, some of TB Reach's work has been um, done to support um, expanding screening activities. Um, and so I think that link you know and then. Um, Yes, so thank you for that. And then we will move to a final roundup. Thank you. So I think um, both the Reimagining TB Care Initiative um, and um, what TB Reach has been doing is, um, you know, when we talk about people-centered um, care, um, and, and I think, you know, we are still talking about it from how, 
you know, talking about it from a perspective of people going to where the services are. And what we really need to do, particularly with um, these next generational um, digital health technologies or other solutions that are coming down the pipeline is really rethink that model, which is um, how do we bring the services to where the people are, be it rural or urban. And um, it's where they live, where they work, where they congregate and where they socialize. And I think we need to just keep on focusing on, on bringing the services to where the people are and making it really the last resort and an absolute necessity for the people to go where the services are. And so I think there are a lot of um, service delivery approaches that, um, that TB Reach is definitely looking at from that perspective. There are a lot of solutions um, that we're looking at across the organization um, um, to help um, uh, bring those services as close as where um, as possible the people are. And, and so I think that's what we need to start doing, like just reshifting our mindset and the way we do business so that it is bringing the services even beyond point of care but where they really are on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you, Jackie. So I'd like to um, do one quick question. And so in one sentence each, and, and we'll start with you, Henry, what is the one message you would like um, the per listeners and, and participants in this conversation to take away from today? Uh, one message would be, uh, we should not look at to be in isolation because TB is part and parcel of other diseases so that in digital world, it will benefit a lot if it's part of the ecosystem. And in that way, you can reduce even cost the investment that is required for that. Thank you, Henry. Same question to you, Bruce. What message would you like people to take from today's conversation? So we haven't talked a lot about this, but better, shorter treatments for TB are on the way, um, which is exciting. Um, but in the interim, I hope that we can move with the kind of pace that we have this last 12 to 18 months um, to use this growing digital toolkit to move ever closer towards truly differentiated, truly personalized, truly uh, concordant care. Thank you, Bruce. Saskia? Thanks. Yes, I'd like to also uh, echo what uh, Jackie was just saying. Um, we need basically to have diagnosis uh, and treatment uh, at the place where the people are. Uh, so I think we need uh, to really uh, it restore also post COVID, uh, the sort of gap that was created in, in TB case detection. So we can expand uh, TB screening, restore case detection and make full use of the, all this technology uh, and tools that is available to us to ensure that we find and treat all, all people with TB. Thank you, Saskia. Jackie, your takeaway? Yes, um, so from a principles and values perspective, um, my final um, thought is that TB affected people, um, regardless of who they are or where they live, um, deserve and should expect the type of um, healthcare services and support that we would expect for ourselves and for our loved ones. Thank you, Jackie. Um, I'm going to turn over to Kiri in just a second. I wanted to thank all the panelists, Bruce, Saskia, Henry, Jackie, Kiri. I want to thank our producers, Caitlin Jolie and Meredith Hastings, and thank our co-sponsors, um, the Stop TB Partnership and the TB PPM Learning Network. Kiri, I'd like to hear some closing thoughts from you. Um, and thank you so much for being um, our host today and um, take it away, please. Thank you. So uh, I would like, I put it in slides. Now, uh, 
I want to say how how to envision patient cent centered TB care. First of all, very first point is make TB an open open conversation led by TB survivors in all parts of the society because this will address fear, stigma, and discrimination. And again, I'm saying encourage support and educational groups like survivors against TB to support TB patient follow treatment, and they also help TB patient TB survivors to come back into the game of life. You know, and now. third point is provide door to door tb services like t tests are test our tb patient has to undergo test medicine refills transport facility for clinic etc and again user experience dashboards these are very very important this should be in this healthcare sector we are not at the mercy of doctors or any other healthcare service provider employ user experience da dashboard for quality of service provide tb patient with so social safety now this is also very important during when they are sick they can't go out for work you, you you need to help because you need to help them finish the treatment so social safety net is very important it it not only go with the financial benefit it should also be like nutritional benefit and sick leaves and all these things second slide um second slide please yeah now uh, post treatment follow up is also very very essential because remission takes place so ensure that post treatment there is at least for one year you when 3 3 months follow up whatever it's like prescribed i don't know but post treatment follow up is very essential and again here train engage employ tb survivor for advocacy education social support in tb care because they are the one who have been through this they can explain to the people who are going through it in a better way than anybody else because they will have that compassion towards them so it's it's very important thank you thank you kiri on behalf of myself the panel path Thank you all for participating. Thank you, Kiri, for leading us through this conversation. And I think I'd like to to make sure that we leave on that last point, which is employ TB survivors. I think that's a um, you know that is a a way that we can ensure that we are inclusive of of the TB patient experience. Yeah. Um, this has been a a good conversation. I've learned a lot, um, and I hope that we look at this as a part of a dialogue that will continue. Um, it's been great to see old friends participating and and make new acquaintances. Thank you all. Have a good day. Have a good evening. See you all again soon. Happy World TB Day. Bye bye. Thank you.